Okay, so let's see how do I progress from here? I don't. Okay, so um, let me introduce you to Energy Europa Vision first. Then we're going to go into some examples. So uh, we're going to have a little special focus on uh, on um, EM solutions. Um, then uh, dwell a little bit on exploration and then hydrogeology, and then going to wrap it up with a Q and A session. Okay. So, uh, what is the, this new company? It's basically uh, a partnership between three entities. So we've got New Resolution Geophysics uh, from South Africa. We've got Emergo, which is us. We used to be called Arus Geophysica, but in order to try to avoid the confusion, we are changing name, we've got a new website, so it's us. And then we have Geognosia from, um, from Andalusia. And I, um, each of us have got their own main skills. Of course, uh, you know, being geophysicists uh, and physicists and geologists, we, we have been involved throughout our career through um, to, in the entire workflow. But nonetheless, it's fair to say that the core of the expertise in energy sits with that position. Ours is mainly in modeling and geognosis is interpretation and uh, defining exploration projects uh, in general programs in general. Um, so we formed this new company, uh, which has got its headquarters in Spain. Um, so we are the new European provider of advanced airborne geophysical services for uh, pretty much anything that you can apply airborne geophysics to. Um, I already talked about the partners. Um, how do we want to do it? Well, uh, we think we've got very good data, very innovative data, some world first, like a helicopter-borne uh, concurrent TDM mag and grab acquisition. And then we've got very good processing and modeling skills and uh, interpretation capabilities. Um, and we're very, very focused on the client. Um, why do we want to do it? Because we want to provide an alternative to the uh, present uh, scene of airborne geophysics um, consultancy in the continent. And we think we can do a better product at a competitive price. Um, so we've got a headquarters in Spain and a presentation office in Italy, in Pisa, from now. Um, what is it that makes us different from the rest? Uh, basically, we're very, very client oriented. We've got relatively small companies, all uh, very excited about uh, doing things right, not taking shortcuts and, and go to the level that is required by the client. Um, okay, so these are uh, brand new offices in, in Spain, some pictures from that. And uh, so this is where uh, Valverde del Camino sits, that's the headquarters, and then this is where I'm sitting right now in Pisa at the moment. Um, now I'm going to hand over the, um, the presentation, the oral presentation to Oli, um, and I'm going to advance the slides for him. So please, Oli, if you can make yourself seen. Um, I'll be happy. I think I am seen. Um, right. You are. I, I can see you now. Thanks. Okay. Well, um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Oli Wright. I'm the CEO of NRG in South Africa, based in Cape Town. I'm going to give you an overview of NRG, uh, where we came from and where we're at now, and sort of basically condense 16 great years into 10 minutes. <laughs> so um, we were formed in 2005. In the 1990s, I was a CEO, CEO and shareholder of a company called Geodas, which was based in Johannesburg. Um, this time we developed the world's first Triax and helicopter fixed boom uh, gradiometer systems. Geodas was bought out by Fugro in 2000. And then three of us, Adam Wildridge, my brother Roger and myself started um, NLG in 2005. Uh, when our buyout restraints were finished. Um, we had a common goal to form a company that was leading edge, but respected the needs and requirements um, of the customers. And we're still very aware that we are contractors providing service to mining houses, environmental and government agencies. 
Um, we're privately owned, um, and since 2005, we have grown into a company employing more than 50 people. Um, our offices are in Cape Town, Pretoria, Perth, Valverde in Spain, and Pisa in Italy. Um, our head office is in Nuerta, Cape Town, processing finance, finances and the management is run from here. And then operations, R&D, electronic shops on Pretoria, hangars, facilities on Pretoria, and Pretoria is run by my brother, Roger. Uh, we now own a total of 13 fixed wing uh, and rotary wing aircraft. They've all been thoroughly demagnetized, bonded and rewired to ensure that they are dedicated and quiet uh, survey platforms. We built uh, custom degassing facilities and equipment at Vornerwurm. And all our new aircraft are only signed up for production after passing stringent uh, in-house calibrations and tests. Uh, figure of merits and other uh, calibrations are undertaken prior to any uh, project mobilization. So hopefully we arrive and we can just start working. Um, we have safely collected more than four and a half million line kilometers of airborne data in 44 countries. Um, and finally, we're still operating safely in a financially sound, responsible and professional man manner, despite all the additional restrictions um, imposed by COVID. Um, with COVID, each operation comes with a new, uh, constantly changing set of rules. Um, addition, uh, more pressures are imposed on the crews and the ops department. Um, but I'm personally very impressed to how our crews have complied with uh, multiple COVID isolations, tests, solitary comp uh, quarantines um, without complaint. I think it's a testament to the ethos um, of our company. Um, to date, we have managed to still service the industry in a professional and timely manner despite the pandemic. Hopefully, we can carry on doing that. Okay, uh, Andrea, yeah. This is a quick map of where the management and uh, NRG has worked. Um, I think the point here, as you can see, Europe's got no orange dots on. So that we're hoping to address in the short and medium term. Okay. Um, we've got four sort of specialist um, technologies. It's uh, we've trademarked them all beginning with an X is the Extract, Excite, Exact, and Explorer. Could go, go on, Andrea. Um, go to the next slide, please, Andrea. So the, for the first one is the Excite um, time domain uh, system. This, uh, we started developing in 2012. Um, commercial survey started in 2015. Um, it's an inflatable loop assembly, the bird. Uh, we uh, decided on this approach um, it, it, for easy and repeatable assembly, and it um, packs up small and is quick to uh, employ when we get to a new job. Um, the system has extremely fast shuttle times, no, low noise levels, and what sets it apart from other systems is it uh, records fully streamed data. So. The gates uh, can be binned and adjusted uh, post-flight to suit your target or to see what results you're getting. Uh, we've got 12, 12 and a half and 25 hertz available. Um, another newer in innovation is our MAG sensor is actually mounted on the bird. That means that um, it's also flying at about 30 meters above ground, giving you a better signal to noise ratio. Um, we record the mag at 1,000 hertz, and then we cut out the pieces that are in the off times, and we end up with a pretty good quiet mag for an EM system. Uh, the plan is to have permanently deployed systems um, throughout Africa, Australia, and Europe. It will sort of ensure um, quick mobilization and reduced mobilization costs. And as usual, we've got like, continually working um, on improvements with uh, a very focused approach to R&D. Okay. okay, the other system, the next sort of system is our horizontal gradient um, helicopter system, that's explorer system, we can move on. Um, we first built this in 2005, it was the world's first uh, composite boom helicopter gradient system. 
which is definitely the most proven uh, horizontal gradient uh, helicopter-borne system on the market. It's got extremely low levels of noise. Um, since we started uh, flying the system, we've flown well over three and a half million line kilometers. Um, and because we measure the gradient and we're flying at very low level, we delineate our features far better than um, a, a conventional system. And we get proper definition of uh, very subtle anomalies. Okay. Um, the fixed wing uh, is known as the exact system. It's once again a horizontal gradient. Um, that's the two beams you can see pointing out in the front there. Um, we use Pilatus. We have two Pilatus PC6 aircraft and a Reams um, F406 uh, twin turbine. The PC6s we use onshore and the, the 4S6s is generally used for offshore uh, oil work. Um, once again, all the aircraft have gone undergone uh, extensive demagging, grounding, rewiring, and the magnetic sensors kept, kept really low. Um, the Pilatus PC6 is known as a workhorse uh, throughout Africa and the rest of the world, and uh, all, the, all the aircraft have long range tanks um, fitted as well. Go next. Okay, then the, um, our gravity systems. Um, once again, they've flown in the Pilatus PC6. Full speed, that's about 110 k's an hour. And gravity, the slower you can fly, the better your data. Um, we use either uh, the GT2A gravimeter or recently an IMR strap down uh, unit. Um, and we sort of choose between these dependent on the application. Um, they are total field gravimeters. Um, they're housed in our patented uh, thermally controlled units. Uh, most of the drift with, a, um, with gravity meters is uh, temperature related and uh, we've really reduced this um, a lot. Uh, So the slower you fly, the more accurate or the better the resolution of your uh, anomalies. And we can fly really slow with the PC-6. Okay. Okay, so this is like a, a new exciting development. Um, it's basically a strapped down a lasering uh, gyro, which was developed for, um, if you can just move on, uh, Andrea. It was developed for um, uh, navigation, uh, basically developed for the military uh, in the event of the GPS network being shut down, you'd still be able to navigate your various weaponry with it. Um, and uh, we became aware of this unit in about 2019. Uh, in 2020 and started doing uh, test flights and comparisons uh, to existing airborne data. Um, basically how it works is that you, you've got very accurate INS uh, navigation data. The difference between the GPS and the INS is normally due to or is due to gravity, uh, which is what we try to measure. Um, we've already flown, despite only starting, well, we commissioned the survey, the system in uh, early this year. We flew a five and a half thousand K survey just to prove it. Um, and since then, we've already flown 20,000 Ks of low level data. Um, this is in addition to whatever else we're doing. The EM, we added to the EM system, we added to the uh, chopper systems, we added to the fixed wing systems. Um, it's got a, a relatively good, um, uh, accuracy that's sub medical resolution and with a half wavelength of less than two kilometers. Um, and this is new technology. It's the first time there's ever been something you can put in an aircraft, fly at low level, flight in turbulent uh, conditions, uh, coupled with EM or MAG, radiometrics, and still get um, good gravity data. It's definitely a world's first. Okay. This is just a quick glance. Uh, Ilse is going to go uh, more into this. It's just a quick glance at what we, our test survey, it was 5,500 Ks. Um, 
We flew it at 300 meters spacing, uh, 50 meters above ground uh, in the Friedefort Dam area, which is in South Africa. Uh, we chose this area because there was ground gravity data available. And you can just have a quick look, the airborne on the left, ground gravity, the difference between the two. At the same time, we collected very good um, gradient uh, enhanced magnetics and ternary radiometrics. This was flown in a helicopter and was flown, it's a fairly rugged area, it was flown um, just in all conditions. Okay, can move on. What it does do is show you that you can collect all of these uh, various things together. Um, safety is paramount, obviously. Uh, we have an impeccable um, safety record and we've got well entrenched uh, reporting structures. This just happens the whole time. Um, okay. And yeah, th that's about it. It's a very quick overview. I'd just like to thank you all for your time and thanks to all our clients for the great support in the last um, 16 years. Um, I'll now hand over to Isla Fernandez from our Spanish office to carry on. Thanks, Oli. Isla, can you put your mic back on, please? And then I'll be driving for you. Hello. For us, it's a really great day, and thank you very much for all of you to come. Uh, I am Isla Fernandez, Technical Director of uh, Geognosia and also Fanda. And I am going to do a brief uh, introduction of Geognosia. Geognosia is a company that offers international and, in, and international consulting and services in geophysics and topography and providing all of these surveys as the client demand. Avoiding fashion, our aim is empirical exploration uh, geophysics through a rigorous uh, project evaluation based on close to 20 years of experience. We propose the best methodology carefully considering limitation of each individual method, local constraints, geological or, um, or logistic, and cost. And uh, I, I'm going to introduce our team, the, Geof the Geognosia team. Is next slide. Okay. I'm Isla Fernandez, as I have told you. Uh, I'm the technical director and also founded Geognosia close to 20 years ago. Uh, and now Manuel Macias is my partner, is the manager director. Also, part of our equipment, uh, of our uh, team, sorry, is Emilio Mora, which is who is the logistic manager and used to be the operator of most of the surveys that we do. And also a new acquisition in our company is Aaron Gamboa, is a junior geophysicist who is becoming to be an explorer very fast. And also, I would like to say briefly that we have the equipment to do some of the, the, the surveys that we do. We have a gravity meter, also we have equipment to do uh, ground EM and also uh, AMT, which is a technique that now we are using a lot. We are providing these services to uh, mostly the, the mine, uh, mineral exploration, but also we are working for hydro, hydrogeo, hydrogeology. We are working as well for archaeology and geotechnics, and we are doing much more uh, works now for geothermal uh, exploration. So that's all right now. Okay, thanks, Isla. We'll get back to you when you put down the track. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to present uh, Emergo, um, which is this, uh, it's, it's a new name, new branding of an old company. And uh, basically we used to be Orister Physica and there was too much confusion in the industry. But anyway, it was funded by myself and Antonio in 2012. And we've always been working in niche application of airborne EM um, data acquisition. Uh, so whether it was hydrogeology or exploration or geotechnical, we've always, we've always been pushing the, the data to to the last uh, detail that they could uh, deliver. 
And uh, we have very much a, a tailor's approach. Um, it's not, uh, we, we spend time on the data and we'll continue doing that uh, with this um, new, uh, new adventure. So I'm the president, uh, Antonio is a very senior and partner of mine in, in the medical geologist. Then I've got Elena and your physicist and um, last kid on the block uh, is Francesco, the junior geophysicist. Um, okay, so why, this is an important slide for us. So we're new, we're small, um, we have to convince you that we can do well. Um, and uh, this is why we believe we can do well. Because we've got, we think alike, basically. We've got three relatively small companies, very flexible. We're all very focused on clients' need, which made this merger very natural for um, offering something new in, in Europe. Um, the fact that we all sit uh, below the same roof, which is Energy Europa, means that we, our complementary skill sets can be drawn upon seamlessly throughout the project. There will be projects where we only have to provide good data only, and that's fine. We'll stop there. We'll help you design the survey. We'll, do, we'll, we'll, we'll study the, the geology, the certain information that's present so we can design the best possible way. There will be other projects where what you need at the end is a drilling target or a, um, a calibrated from model. And we can go all the way to there as well. So very, very much um, client, um, client oriented. Um, and I think this is one of our strengths. Let's see. Okay, a couple a slide, a couple of more on modeling. Um, because this is a, one of our uh, strengths. So we run all sorts of inversions, so specially constrained inversion, smooth and sharp, few and multi-layer. We can apply ancillary information uh, as a priori. We model IP data, um, which is becoming more and more uh, popular and relevant in the industry. We can do blade models. Um, uh, we are uh, sponsoring innovative EM modeling codes. Um, in terms of, um, of gravity, uh, we can do lots of things uh, that um, Isla will uh, dwell upon a little bit more. Uh, but obviously, given that we can acquire at once Ebony and Mag and Graph, means uh, we can do some very robust uh, joint modeling and versions and interpretation of these different uh, physical properties. And of course, we can do geological and hydrogeological models uh, if needed. Um, I'm going to give you a little focus on the EM part of, um, of the solutions that we offer. Um, so, uh, Oli already presented Excite. I'm not going to go too much on this slide, beside perhaps, perhaps pointing out that, again, that we record string data um, with a sample every 6.4 microseconds, which means that uh, throughout uh, an entire transcend, you get hundreds, if not thousands, of, uh, of um, stream data, which can be ribboned whichever way we want. Um, it doesn't mean that we always do it, but it means that we can do it. So there will be places where binning one way rather than another can actually make the difference in extracting the extra bit of information that is present in the stream data. So everything is completely customizable. Uh, we offer 25 and 12 and a half Earth um, base frequency solutions and uh, relatively fast uh, shutoff time. Well, very fast for a single moment system. So 400 microsecond uh, shutoff time. Um, okay, I'm gonna show you a comparison done by a third party. This is by Geoscience Australia, um, Isan Lake Cooper. As some of you know, they uh, designed this um, test range in Australia, it's called the Menindi uh, test range, which they got uh, every single system that wanted to be on their deeds to fly for government to fly over. Um, so then they put together, regularly put together these, um, these reports. And um, I'm gonna show you the results from a line there. So these data were acquired by VTEM in 2014, by Tempest in 2017, by Skyton 312 in 2015, and by Exciting 2019. They have been processed and inverted by Geoscience Australia, who's in their, uh, using their GA LEI code. And um, why is Menindee range quite 
um, spectacular because I've got this down hole EM measurements that you can see in here um, that are uh, really worthy for comparing results against. Uh, and this uh, sky you don't see too much rather than the system work and your physics works, which is great. They actually deliver similar results. Um, now I'm gonna focus more on the sky uh, on the near surface first, because I presume most of you will be interested in that. Again, so this is a close up of the first 100 meters or so. You can see how the different systems uh, compare. And then I'm gonna focus even more on the system you are probably most familiar with, which is Skyton. And then Excite, and this is the comparison. Let me draw your attention to the fact that there is a problem with the DTM of the Excite inversion model. So you can see that it sits above the, uh, the top of the drillings. So these drillings uh, need to be brought back to surface or vice versa, DTM down. I couldn't get uh, USAN to, to rework on those features uh, in time for me, but I just did it uh, brute force. So the next slide you will see these drillings coming to surface, which is where they should be, which is where you see them in the Skyton and version results. So <laughs> I manually put them back up and you can see you can see the comparison. So good near surface resolutions over resistors and conductors, and very similar results. I believe the inversions had been set with exact similar same settings, even though I can't confirm right now uh, that at the moment. Um, then uh, um, another thing, as I said, that makes us a little bit special is that you know our our uh, strong suit at, uh, or uh, at medical is modeling EM data. So we want to improve. We want to improve the system, and whilst Ollie works on the hardware, we work on the on the modeling. So these are results obtained from Oris Workbench, and um, recently uh, you've been able to uh, invert for bias in in the workbench. And basically, so these are results that you obtained from Excite from Australia, data set that I'm gonna be talking about later. If you take a standard inversion, and uh, there are some, some layers, some near surface layers resistive that are somewhat dubious. We don't have drillings in here, but in terms of geological maps, they pose some sort of doubt. Um, and then in Workbench now, you can actually solve for bias. So, which is what these inversion output um, relates to. So we actually saw for bias, this is red uh, wiggle in here, goes up and down. So uh, we improved the results working in, in the model space, if you wish, um, taking into account uh, what is realistic for bias to move um, in, the, in a survey or, or during, uh, during an acquisition line. So now we got rid of that uh, dubious near surface resistive layer. The dike looks more realistic. Overall, a better product. And as I said, you know, Energy Europa will work on the all three three legs: acquisition, modeling, and intro. Um, Airborne AP. Um, why am I talking about Airborne AP? Because we provide IP modeling of Airborne EM data on all Excite servers, um, which I think we are the only one in the world doing that. Um, in Europe. So EBONEP is a physical process that takes place when you got uh, something that uh, whose capability of uh, conducting um, current changes with frequency. Normally people relate to talk about round AP, uh, but the same physical processes take place at higher frequencies and are recorded in EBONEM um, soundings as well. Why is it important? Because I, if you don't model AP, your resistivities will likely be wrong. Um, and also because modeling AP will give you an extra set of physical properties, which is the chargeability, which can be very useful for exploration, but also for uh, geotechnical applications, uh, for uh, integration with remote sensing. It's a complementary um, data set. Uh, with respect to resistivity for whatever you want to do downstream of the Airborne EM modeling. Um, I'll show you a couple of examples of Airborne AP, why it is important. This is from Australia, uh, WI. So we've got Excite down here, and we've got two different uh, 
versions of Bitcoin acquisition over a known deposit called Abra. This is the deposit in here. All systems see it clearly. But we also say that some um, transcends go negative. I will, at the moment, I'll talk about negatives in, in only, but in reality, it's not that if you don't have negatives, you don't have IP, because you can clearly see that before the, the signal goes negative, it starts decaying very, very fast. So the fact that you may not have negatives in your system, in your survey, doesn't mean you don't have IP. Anyways, so this was, uh, we took the Excite data and we used a known uh, geometry of the deposit uh, to see what, the, what sort of impact it had if you model AB. So these are known mineralizations described in different ways from drilling or from down all the end. And uh, I just took the outline of Abra and uh, Central and Ale, these three known mineralizations. And um, I'll show you what happens to the resistivity if you um, do not model IP. So if you do not model IP and IP was present in the data, these are the resistivities that you obtain. Yes, you see our brush, but you'd be hardly pushed to see anything in terms of central and I. If you do model IP, these are the resistivities they pull out. It's not perfect, but it's there, and A is definitely there, and you still see our brush. Um, and I'll show you another example because this is not system specific. This will happen on any system that you fly and do not model IP on. This is an example from um, Skyton data. So um, uh, I worked with it together with, with Skyton. We, we applied airborne IP modeling back then. And uh, so this was resistivity that was obtained if one didn't model IP on the top. In the bottom, the resistivity and the associated chargeability that one obtains if models IP. And if you just focus on the resistivity, you will say how different these, uh, these models look alike. For those of you that do exploration, you, you know, you may have been hitching a little bit to, to go and drill this thing. In reality, this is much more likely to be a geological horizon. So as you can see, if you do model IP, and we're fitting the data very well. Now, I'll another few slides to talk about the relevance of chargeability per site as an extra physical parameter. These are data from Mexico. Um, and uh, this was a VTIM survey. And I, they did a lot of ground IP as well. So ground IP are these lines in here that go sort of north, northwest, south, south, east. In the background, you've got the VTIM based uh, uh, cow um, as calculating on the VDT curves. And uh, in purple in here, you've got the um, joint anomalies of ground IP inversion. So they, they did a ground IP, um, they did inversion, then they joined the chargeable highs with these purple dots in there. Um, next comes uh, a section. I'll go back to the map view, but first I'm going to show you a section. This is Chargeability expressed as a phase in the workbench. You can do multiple phase angle as well, but just call call. And um, <clears throat> um, even though this is a work that was done in cooperation with Gianluca Fendaka at uh, Universita Statale Milano. And um, this is phase as obtained from VTAM data. This was phase as obtained from Grand IP. And you can see there are some chargeable highs in there. In there, these are the drilling SIs with the uh, warm colors, the pinks, uh, the blues, um, and the, and the greens uh, being associated to the highest chargeability, uh, to the highest uh, mineralizations of silver. And now what I'm going to do, I'm going to keep the envelope of the ground IP anomalies um, and make the rest transparent, and in the background put the Vitam based chargeability anomalies, which is what you see here. So the envelopes come from the ground IP and the background is the airborne EM based. And you can see there are some places that match very well, others not that well, but we should uh, never forget that we are talking about inversions based uh, on data that come from very different sources, um, that got different uh, uh, footprints, different volumes of excitation, different frequencies that we're working on. Nonetheless, they do provide complementary data sets, which are very interesting. Um, and this is uh, going back to the plan view map. So in purple are the chargeability highs as, uh, 
sustained by uh, joining the, um, the eyes of the ground IP inversions. And in the background, we've got the chargeability at 170 meters, I should say the phase and meter radius at 170 meters depth as obtained from the airborne EM data. And you can see some clear correlations between um, the uh, airborne EM base chargeability and the ground IP base chargeability. This is very exciting. Um, this is in 3D. This is an, uh, a volume of hot chargeability highs as obtained from VITA. In the background, you've got the same map of the beginning, ingrained the chargeability highs as obtained from the ground. And you can see this works of, um, of chargeable highs, which um, may be associated to swarms of, uh, of knockoff veins. Um, the last focus on, um, on um, Ebony End is uh, again cooperation uh, we're doing with Jennifer Fendaka and Fresh Harris in this case. And uh, we want to talk about how can one best integrate ancillary information. In Europe, quite regularly, we've got a lot of ancillary information and, and we want to use it. Um, the Netherlands, where France is normally working in, is a clear example. You've got a ton of very good data. And you want to use that uh, in your interpretation. Now you can apply it as a priori to the version. There's many different ways of doing it. This is a very innovative way of doing it, which we believe um, can um, save a lot of troubles um, to, to the geologists that have to work with the final results. So this is synthetic data, synthetic model on the left. So sand dunes, clay, freshwater clay, brackish aquifer. This is what Excite would see without any drilling using a standard L2 model. Um, and this is the innovation in here. This is what Excite would see using an asymmetric generalized medium support uh, norm. It already sees better than that. But then we add the drilling. So um, in this inversion and this inversion in the central um, column in here, we have a joint inversion of ebonium data plus information coming from the drilling. And these drillings are correct. Um, so they are consistent with the data and the geological model. And what do they do? They improve the results. They improve the sensitivity, as you would expect, uh, using both norms. Now, what happens if you've got a drilling which is wrong? And this happens. No matter where you come from, for whatever reason, your drilling that you have in the database may be wrong. Now, if you use that as a priori, to your inversion of airborne EM data using a standard L2 norm, this is what you get. You get a, a model which suffers from the wrong information that's in there. If you use the asymmetric generalized media support, it basically doesn't, doesn't use it that much. It, it, it understands that it's an outlier and it won't use it to try to fit it, which means you get the best of both worlds uh, with from the good drillings, you get the extra information and where you have the bad drilling is basically ignored. And on top of that, we also get a flag that is a bad drilling. So that is um, something um, that we think for in some countries that with certain data support will be quite useful. Um, I think this was it on my end. I'm gonna hand it back to Isla, please. And I'll be your driver. Yeah, hello. Hello. Uh, one of our main sectors that uh, we would like to be involved is, of course, the mineral exploration. So we would like to uh, show you how we can, uh, how energy understand the exploration. Uh, Europa is still a mining company, uh, but completely different than other countries. Of course, the targets are here much uh, smaller and, and deeper, and due the, to higher population, there is much more cultural noise. So uh, we would need to get um, geophysical exploration, but must be, must be planned accord accordingly with the, with the exploration that we are going to have in Europe. Energy in Europe was born trying to understand the geological models, the real targets of the exploration of different European mining areas, translating the geological models into physical properties and then looking for the best methodologies to use in every different case, including the best configuration of these methodologies and best way to process and model and model the data to interpret the, the results in direct contact always with the geologists. 
in Energy Europe, we would like to think as explorers, not just as geophysicists, taking into account uh, during all the steps of the surveys, from the, uh, from the configuration to the phase of the, of the interpretation, the goal of the exploration, looking, of course, for mining targets. Energy, Energy Europe offers airborne EM, MAC, and gravity. That means that can be used for greenfield exploration, exploring big areas with gravity, MAC, and EM to better understand the structural geology, or to map areas with different types of cover and for brownfield exploration to look for target scenarios with much more detail, uh, changing the, conf the configuration of the surveys uh, to go through the, the direct targets that we are looking for. To understand better how we can understand, the, how we can think about the, 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 um, the exploration from the airborne uh, EM and all the other methodologies that we are using, we are going to show a comparing uh, response from different AEM systems and uh, in, in an area of uh, Botswana, uh, the Sunni Site Nickel project. This uh, project, uh, we have some preliminary information and this, this uh, comparison was uh, shown in the ASEC uh, conference in 2018. So, uh, we have some preliminary uh, information about the target and the, uh, the bigger problem of the, of the, the biggest problem of the target were that it was very complicated body. And to locate the, the new drill holes, uh, the, the, uh, the, the company that was exploring would uh, try to, to get more information from the, ge from the geophysics. So, they did uh, an AMT regional uh, survey and for that, they model up the data and they've got different sections. This is one of the, the sections that they've got and also with the, with the, the drill holes that they have. And uh, at the right, we can see the, the, um, the model that they did with the, with the AMT related with the, all the, the drill holes that they had. Also, in the middle of the slide, we have in blue the, the AMT model that they've got and in red, in that red, they, the, the real um, mineralization that they knew from the, from the, from the drill holes. And then uh, we are going uh, to compare with the regional AMT, they did several uh, AEM surveys uh, at different times, uh, uh, beat them in 2008, then Spectrum in 2012, uh, Skytem in 2013, and Excite in 2016. Not all the, the surveys cover the same areas, uh, and at the right we can see the, the lines that they flow with every system. And, and then we can see the, the comparison that we have with, uh, with the AMT models, also the elevation of the top of the deposit and with the, a very um, uh, system that they use uh, to, to fly over the area. So uh, the first one is with Excite and uh, the columns are the, the, the 1D resistivity models without interpol interpolation. So we can see that uh, and the pink line is the elevation of top of the deposit. And we can see from this slide that the correlation with the AMT and the top of the deposit with the excite data is very good. Then we can go for the next uh, slide, which is the comparison of the VTEM with the, with the same <coughs> sorry, with the same uh, background image and also with the elevation of the top of the deposit and uh, it's difficult to fit the data maybe due to the very fast decay in early part of the transit. But in this case, the, the correlation is not as good as in the previous slide with the XI data. And then last slide of this uh, example is the SkyTem. Once again, with the same uh, background image, and also, also with the elevation of the top of the deposit. And once again, we can see that the correlation is very good uh, with 
the AMT and the total of the deposits. So, uh, in this example, the Excite and the Skyten data has uh, very good results related with the result that we got with the beaten, beaten data. Then, uh, I would like to uh, speak a little bit more about the Explorer um, system that we are offering. I think one of the main advances that we, can, we are offering is that uh, the possibility that we can, that, uh, to do all the different methodologies at the same time and, and in the, with the same platform. So, uh, I think it's very important uh, that um, the first time that we can do gravity, MAC, radiometrics and also EM at the same time and getting data uh, that we can model uh, together and also we can compare together and so it's, it's a really a, a big advance that mostly we can use for Greenfield because uh, we are still having resolutions in gravity of uh, submilligal, but uh, of course we are in, uh, working on that, trying to improve the resolution and get uh, the, the system, uh, the gravity system uh, useful for uh, direct targets as well. So now uh, is much more useful for uh, structural geology or um, areas in which we, we are not needing a uh, really high resolution. So we can, uh, in this case, uh, I'm going to, to present the, the data that uh, Energy South Africa collect during, the, during February of this year, just to get data to better evaluate the, the, the system and to work with, uh, with this data to get a better uh, resolution from, from all the surveys that we will provide uh, uh, from now. So we can go for next slide. So, uh, the gravity data were compared with ground gravity data that uh, uh, was, uh, I think, uh, provided by the Geological Institute of South Africa. And uh, the resolution that we have in the, in the ground is uh, the, the spacing that we have from the, from the ground is one kilometer to 3.5 uh, kilometer. So, it's a regional survey, of course. So, but uh, we would like to have the same this kind of surveys because the, the, the resolution that we have from the air one is more or less the same. So we are going to compare with the, the rectangle that we are seeing in this uh, slide, which is the survey area. And in this uh, in this area, we have more or less one, 150 stations from the ground. And uh, all the data were uh, gridded at 500 meters, grid cell size. And uh, the comparison that we have at the uh, left is uh, the Bouguer corrected and uh, one milligal contour interval. Uh, the, the, one, the image at the right at the left is the ground uh, uh, gravity and the one is the A and the one at the right is the uh, airborne one. And we can see that the, the correlation with both images is very, very high. So we can uh, show that the, the, the structural geology, of course, is really well uh, mapping from the airborne. And, uh, it's not, uh, it's very difficult to see here, but the resolution of the image of the airborne gravity is much more higher than the one that, uh, the, from the ground. But this is due uh, as well, uh, much more because the, the, um, in the ground we have not enough data to compare with. But at the right, we can see the horizontal gradient uh, enhanced with the total magnetic field data. And we have also uh, the comparison between the ground and also the, the, the airborne. So what is very important in this example is that uh, the, we have not lost uh, any, any resolution from the MAC, uh, with the MAC and with the radiometrics. Uh, instead, um, the excessive uh, height deviation that we should have because we are using gravity. So it's very important to show that we can do uh, uh, different methodologies at the same time and we are not losing resolution in any of them. So we can go for the last uh, image, which is just, which is the last 
Last, last slide. Okay, uh, it's just to, to show that uh, we have also the same resolution with the, with the radiometrics. And uh, what I have said is very important that we are not losing any uh, resolution working with all the, all the methodologies together. And, and of course, uh, I think it's a really advanced uh, that uh, we can offer the helicopter for low level gravity, uh, magnetic and radiometric data that can be collected uh, simul simultaneously and is the first time that uh, that has been done around the world. Okay. Okay, thanks Isla. So the last um, session will be conducted by Antonio. Um, Antonio Mignini, okay, I'm gonna drive okay. you. Good morning to everybody. Uh, thanks to participate in this webinar. So Ebonium is very useful for hydrogeology. First of all, because resistivity is a physical parameter that is strictly related to uh, granulometry, to hydraulic conductivity, and also to water quality, to salt content of water. But there is another important feature that of uh, Airborne EM that is uh, very uh, useful for other geologists, that is the um, capability to cover very large areas in a short time and with a relative, relatively low cost, so that we can uh, use Airborne EM to uh, achieve uh, a detailed hydrogeological modeling that is very important for groundwater management. So that the, uh, the, 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 the main application for other geology are the freshwater exploration. That means uh, to search for a resistive target in the case we are looking for granular aquifer in uh, quartz uh, granular aquifer or conduct, more conductive uh, targets in the case of fractured uh, aquifer. Uh, there is also a very useful uh, application for seawater intrusion where the target is obviously uh, very conductive. But uh, we can also apply a uh, body M in order to estimate the thickness of uh, potential um, aquiclude, clay aquiclude that could uh, uh, prevent, that could uh, protect uh, um, deep uh, uh, water. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, just uh, the, the, a list of the, of the main projects uh, that uh, we followed with Orus Geophysics uh, in the past. And uh, if we uh, focus our attention uh, in the European continent, uh, we have worked for um, LBEG, that is the Geological Survey of Lower Sassoni, with uh, Danish, of course, uh, it, it was the, the, the first and the most important uh, project with uh, Think Water, that is a national groundwater project, with the Dutch uh, Artesia, which is a groundwater company. And uh, last but not least, in Italy, we uh, worked for two water authorities, CAP, Milan, and Adwea, and uh, for a CNR. Uh, next slide. So I have selected just a few of, uh, slides uh, drawn from, uh, from our talk that uh, we'll present uh, at Near Surface Geophysics uh, in Bordeaux and at uh, IAH uh, Congress in Bruxelles the next uh, September. Uh, so um, I hope that uh, some of you could be ab able to, to attend this meeting in, in, in the flesh, I <laughs> hope, for everyone. So uh, this is um, the, the, the largest Airborne EM survey performed in uh, Australia, in, uh, sorry, in uh, New South Wales, in New South Wales, um, by, and it was uh, performed by Energy with the excite. Uh, so this is uh, just a close up of the area, is the southern portion of the, of the area. And the uh, other geology is, uh, is simple. Uh, there is a very uh, diffuse, very wide uh, cover of quaternary deposit. 
that uh, mask uh, almost everywhere the bedrock. Bedrock is composed by sandstone, volcanics, and granites. The water issues is very <laughs> dramatic because uh, they need to pipe the, the water very far or they need to uh, desalinize uh, the brackish water. There are two main aquifers. The first one is alluvial, uh, shallow aquifer, uh, that is uh, inside, within uh, Palo Channel that can reach uh, thickness of uh, up to eight, uh, 80 meter, meters. And uh, there is a, a second aquifer that is uh, in, uh, within the bedrock in fractured sandstone. Next slide. So the main outcome are uh, um, essentially uh, two. One is the, the very good resolution of shallow uh, layers. Uh, this is um, thanks to the, to the possibility to uh, use uh, very early times. We, we were able to invert, to fit the data by using uh, uh, the first gate at only 10 microseconds. That is a very, very uh, mar markedly uh, outcome. And uh, it's so in the, in the left side, you can see the, the transient with, with our fitting. And uh, secondly, uh, we can reach very um, great depth of investigation down to three, four hundred meters. Of course, this depends uh, on the on the resistivity of the of the subsurface on the background noise. But essentially, if you look at the right map, uh, you can see that uh, for most of the area, we uh, reach the, the the maximum depth of exploration. Next. So this is a view from the south. Uh, is a collection of of different flights with our modeling. In in this case, the uh, red color represents low resistivity, while red uh, sorry blue blue ones the the more resistive uh, rocks. And um, so uh, at first sight, you can see that uh, there is a um, wide. Uh, uh, distribution of uh, conductive shallow sediments, uh, essentially clays or uh, sand uh, filled with saline water, interrupted by outcrops of bedrock. This is the, 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 the mountains or hills uh, uh, imaged by the blue color. Uh, next slide. So if we restrict our attention uh, to, to some uh, uh, zoomed part, uh, you can see the, the good resolution of, the, of both aquifers. Uh, the the Aluva aquifers that is uh, uh, imaged as a brown layer in these uh, uh, boreholes. This is uh, the comparison between uh, available stratigraphic logs from uh, productive wells and our uh, modeling in the background. So with the gray uh, color, I have uh, imaged all the aquiculutes, either in the um, layer are the aluva aquifer, and you can see uh, this in this uh, well a good uh, fit uh, between the, the, the conductive uh, features that uh, Mm, uh, agree agrees very well with uh, with the aluva aquifers, most likely due to the um, occurrence of uh, saline water within uh, this more permeable uh, layer. But if you go uh, to the next slide, uh, you can uh, uh, prize also the good resolution of fractured aquifers. So the the blue layer in the in the uh, stratigraphic logs uh, in display the 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 aquifers so that uh, in the left side uh, we were able to resolve the, the more fractured sandstone that is uh, less resistive than the massive sandstone on the right. So there is a good uh, confirmation and uh, it is important to, no to notice also the, the, the vertical scale of, of, of elevation so that uh, we are looking at very, very fine details. So next slide, it's uh, 
this is a, a complete flight line, so many, many kilometers. Pay attention about the um, vertical exaggeration. But uh, once again, it, it is uh, interesting to compare the static graphic logs with the uh, resistivity modeling. For example, the sand aquifer in the in the in the middle and the well in the middle, it is well imaged by the, the resistivity contrast. While the, the in, on the right side, the other, bo, uh, the other well intercepted a clay sand aquifer that is uh, more conductive. And uh, of course, it depends also on the, on the granulometry. But uh, there is also another important uh, outcome that is structural information. In this slide, uh, we overlap the bedrock geology. Uh, this map shows some uh, nose uh, faults uh, derived from other geophysics and uh, mag gravel and so on. And uh, you can see that uh, we were able to uh, resolve very accurately the, the no false, first of all, uh, that are uh, imaged as black lines. But there are also many, many other uh, faults that uh, I haven't uh, drawn in, in, this, uh, in this section. But uh, if you, if you uh, look in detail, you can find many, many of these uh, resistivity, uh, lateral resistivity passages. So uh, it, it, and this is, uh, these are structural features that are below the, the cover. Next slide. So let me spend just a few uh, words about the, the hydrogeological modeling that is crucial outcome uh, because we can uh, provide also uh, hydrogeological modeling. Of course, it depends upon your um, needs. Uh, I mean, if you want simply resistivity modeling, we can produce only resistivity, okay? But if uh, we can collaborate with uh, our geologists, our experts, we can work together and to, uh, in order to achieve uh, to a more complete uh, outcome. If this is a case from um, British Columbia, Peace River. Uh, this, uh, this is um, the, the outcome of SkyTem uh, data, but we can, of course, of course, we can apply this methodology also to excite data. And uh, this is um, this work was performed together with Gauss, the Geological Survey of Denmark. And uh, so you can see that uh, in this slide uh, we have uh, interpreted the resistivity uh, layers by means of the available uh, static graphic logs so that we um, pick it manually the geological contacts okay uh, so that uh, next slide we were able to extract uh, very uh, detailed and useful information in order to improve uh, the knowledge uh, of the bedrock, but also of the glacial drift. Look at the at the well in the in the top. Uh, uh, within this uh, very very deep quaternary uh, paleo uh, valley, buried valley that is filled by uh, glacial drift. The the black the sorry the white uh, layer mm -hmm. image uh, glacial drift without any distinction. But we were able to uh, resolve a more resistive layer at the at the bottom, this very deep uh, valley that is uh, uh, almost uh, 200 meters that, uh, so that uh, we can uh, resolve the bedrock. And in the bottom section, you can see the, our capability with our advanced processing to resolve uh, very fine details within the glacial drift, uh, so that to, to resolve uh, resistive glacial layers from glacial lacustrine and so on. Next. So uh, essentially, by we start with the feed resistivity model, we add the geological maps and information from uh, stratigraphic logs, so to interpret the data and to achieve to a geological modeling by means of uh, this software just in 3D, and uh, so that. Um,
voxel of uh, lithology, a voxel of uh, uh, hydrogeological parameters, uh, whatever you want. In order to start the uh, next slide, yeah, this is a, a zoom part, but uh, we can go to, to the last one in which uh, we transfer this information into a uh, flow model by using a fee flow or uh, mud flow uh, or other software. Uh, essentially, in this case, uh, um, other, other geologists uh, uh, use the resistivity modeling in order to start their, their um, hydrogeological modeling. So this is okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Antonio. Okay, I'm sorry we, we hijacked you a little bit longer than anticipated. Um, so we're ready for the Q&A. I'm going to ask uh, Isla and, and, uh, and Ollie and Antonio to have their webcams on. And um, yeah, so in the meanwhile, I'll play a little video in here if I manage. Can I? It's not playing. Ah, it was a nice little video. Okay, so the video started, I think. It doesn't start. The left hand side video doesn't want to start. It was actually pretty nice because you could see the um the system being uh folded back how quickly uh, you can do that and, and, and how small it becomes okay so um first of all thanks for bearing with us i have written down a number of questions and i please anybody within the you know within the uh the us within Energy Europa that wants to take um, the answer, please do that. I guess I'll start. And there's still time to post questions or raise your hand. Uh, please do that if you want. Let me try to take them um, from the top. Um, so uh, there was a question about Sunnyside. Um, Michelle said, I assume it was uh, AMT. Yes, it was. Uh, did we do a static shift of the AMT with the TDM data? No, we didn't. At least I didn't. We only did the EM part of things and then we deliver them back to the client. So I don't know if there was any further work um, after that. Thank you. Now the Amy Hover uh, pre-digested set of uh, questions. Uh, thanks. So um, Mario Carulis, a uh, nice presentation regarding EM. Can you comment what is fast shutoff times? I can see the mess of flights took place in Africa in general deep aquifers. Can we expect in terms of solution first time it is? Okay. Fast uh, turn off uh, means that you turn the current down fast, and which means you uh, introduce a lot of high frequency information into the transit, into the ground, and then you record it back uh, at the receiver. And that is. Uh, paramount to obtain near surface information. Without a fast turn off, you cannot have near surface information. I think the other case study sort of addressed um, um, the concern about you know, um, near surface resolutions, but what can we expect in the first 10 meters? We, it depends on geology. You know, if you have, if you are on a sand dune, um, and the sand dune is like 100 meters thick, you'd be hard pressed to have good resolution the first 10 meters. If you have an alternation of clay layers and something resistive, then you have better resolution in near surface. Um, so I would say you can, you can expect a pretty good resolution in near surface uh, compared to um, overall competition currently present in the international market. Um, regarding AP, are there case studies you can share with us for hydrogeology? Yes, there is one. Um, what can you expect regarding clay fresh water versus sand fresh water in shell aquifers? Uh, in other words, the results you showed with the synthetic scan share case studies. Okay, well, I should mention that the synthetic that I showed that had the uh, drillings in it didn't have IP modeled. Um, why is that? Because in that case, you're never going to see AP uh, in the data because it's too conductive. Um, so the, what made the difference there was the asymmetric minimum gradient support inversion tool. Having said that, there will be instances where 
you will see IP effects um, even in uh, moderate conductivities. Um, you see that you see IP the moment that the PREM response becomes relatively small compared to the IP. If over the ocean, if the ocean were charged, we're never going to see it anyways because the EM overpowers the the IP. So it really depends on geology. We do have an example from South Africa, from Australia, where a conductor turned out to be chargeable, and that conductor it was a buried um, bare valley completely filled with clays and uh, the clays were conductive and chargeable and uh, the acetylene aquifer uh, would have been just conductive and in that case the bedrock was resistant so chargeability really helped a lot in terms of um, discriminating between the two. Elena, thanks for the presentation. Yeah, no worries. Uh, Michelle, will the shell and deep data acquisition possible at the same flight? Yes, uh, it's the same flight. So the sharp, the sharp turn off will give you both the air surface information and quite a good signal to noise ratio because also by driving down your DIDT fast, you also produce a lot of uh, electromagnetic force and response from the ground. So <clears throat> these, uh, these examples were drawn from one flight. Um, 10 nanometer is low fresh, fresh water. Yeah, it depends where you are. Australians would be thrilled with 10 nanometer fresh water. <laughs> But I agree, uh, not something that in, in, uh, in Europe you would call fresh water. Um, from a shell, relatively high resistive layer, soft from equivalence are not well defined. Did you use extra constraints? So this was at 1210. I'm not sure which slide uh, Michelle was referring to, but as I said, yes, there are equivalence problems. Um, we didn't use any extra constraints. I don't think so, unless uh, Michelle can be more specific about um, which slide he was talking about. Um, blah, 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 very scope, uh, thanks to Manuel Baskets. Um, thanks, thanks, thanks. Uh, with Excel system, is it possible to record two different moments alternatively? And another question, what current can the Excel system go up to? So I know at this stage, it's not possible to record uh, two different moments, but maybe Oli can put some more words on that, if you wish. And the current, I think the maximum is, I don't recall the maximum current. Is it probably 200 amps or in that order? Um, Oli, can you help me here? Yeah, yeah, look, uh, two moments uh, at this very, instant no but we are working on that um it's part of our one of our ongoing r and d's and i think it's about 280 amps it's limited by uh our transmitter is driven from the helicopter's generator um and we're limited by that thanks Ollie. um okay i hope we address those um any other questions sorry we're still 40, 40 people of you that hung out with us so long, so thanks for that. Uh, very nice present. Thanks for the answers. Okay. Um, we're going to be here another few minutes, but I'll start by saying that, uh, you know, this was a broad presentation of the concept behind the company, the philosophy, and some preliminary views into things that we thought would appeal to a broad audience. Now, of course, uh, we can talk about ABDM only for a full day. We can talk about ABNP for a full day. We can talk about ABN gravity for a full day. We can talk about our geological models, geological models, flow models, survey, uh, design, all of these things. So if you're interested in uh, something more specific, let's say vertical, diving vertically into a specific aspect, please let us know. The idea is to, was to present to you this opportunity right now before you all head off to, to holidays and in, uh, in summer to put a, a, bit of, a little bit of doubt in your brain. Um, but we will get back um, in, uh, at the end of summer with dedicated vertical specialized meetings. But in the meanwhile, we are here, we're ready. We are ready to work right now. So if you have any questions, so, uh, please uh, shoot them either to uh, myself, to Isla, to Antonio, to Ollie, 
Um, you can just write to info at energyx.co.za for the moment and it will land on the proper desk. Um, other than that, we're, um, we're very excited to, to be here to uh, cooperate and interact with you guys to see whether we can address some of the problems you may face with your exploration, with your uh, management or uh, your uh, geotechnology, geotechnological applications, whatever you want to do um, using air bunch of physics. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, Isla, Oli, Antonio, any final remarks on your end before you wrap it up? Um, from my side, I just uh, thank you all for spending this time with us. Um, and we are an open company, open to discussion. Uh, please feel free to contact any of us um, if you need anything. Cheers. Thanks, Oli. Isla? Yes, always the same. Uh, I would like to say thank you to all of the people that has come and also uh, to invite uh, all everybody to ask everything that uh, you would need to know about us. And any new questions uh, would be, uh, of course, uh, answered as soon as possible. And thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Antonio? Uh, just a few words. Uh, I want to stress that. Uh, Energy Europa uh, is a complete team, but uh, this uh, um, doesn't mean that we want uh, everywhere to 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 model interpret your data. I mean, uh, we are flexible. We can uh, just provide uh, raw data. Uh, we can process. We can interpret. We can try. Uh, joint inversion, joint modeling. Uh, we can uh, try to to achieve uh, uh, the final product, but we are flexible. So, um, for example, for mining company, I, I can uh, uh, understand that uh, they uh, would prefer to uh, enroll their um, in-house. Um, um, people in order to to work so it is not uh, um, everywhere any any way uh, a fixed a fixed uh, proposal it's very flexible thanks antonio um okay i don't see any other questions in the queue apologies if i missed any of them please write to us and uh, I'm going to stop the recording and uh, wish you all a great day. And um, we're here to listen. Please reach out to us if you have any other questions. Thank you. Bye. Bye from Bye. the team. Bye.